Very good. I would like to invite Bonnie Faulkner back up to the stage, our MC, and you all know the host of Guns and Butter. One mention, please, and an important mention. In the last video of the Toronto hearings, there was mention of Janet McKinley, Janet McKinley, a woman who is extremely dear to many of us here in Northern California and a member of the Truth, September 11th Truth Movement. We continue to mourn her passing from health effects caused from her nearness to the dust, the toxic and poisonous dust that she made beauty from. Uh, she is someone that we loved deeply. She was the, the beauty, the artist in our movement particularly, and so it was very touching to hear mention of her in the last film. Here's Bonnie. Uh, I want to let you know that the, uh, the Toronto 66-minute edit of the Toronto hearings that you just saw, uh, that is available in the lobby at uh, the 911 TV uh, table. So Ken Jenkins had neglected to mention that, and he wanted me to, uh, to bring that up. We have a very interesting speaker, Mark Gaffney, uh, coming up next. Uh, Mark Gaffney is an environmentalist, a peace activist, and researcher. He's the author of two recent books on neglected aspects of 9-11, Black 9-11, Money, Motive, and Technology, and that is this book, and uh, The 9-11 Mystery Plane and the Vanishing of America, which focus on technologies that were used on 9-11 and the presence of the sophisticated U.S. communications doomsday planes, which were seen above Washington, D.C. on 9-11. He has also written other books, including The First Tree of the Day, Gnostic Secrets of the Nascenes, and Demona, The Third Temple, The Story Behind the Venunu Revol uh, Revolution. Uh, and his books are also available in the lobby. He says he has a, a few left. Um, this... Um, the 9-11 mystery plane is an account uh, of the E-4B plane, which was flying over the White House during uh, the Pentagon attack. It's the most sophisticated command control and communications platform for uh, the Pentagon. Uh, now, he is going to talk uh, this evening about his newest book, Black 9-11, which was an account of uh, financial issues related to and predating 9-11. Now tonight, uh, Mark Gaffney will propose a new shoot-down scenario for Flight 93. So this uh, will prove to be very interesting. Please give a warm welcome to Mark Gaffney. Thank you, yeah. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank Ken Jenkins for organizing this amazing event. We need more of these. <clears throat> and it's my sincere hope that the research I've done can help people understand what happened that day. I think we can conclude, based on what we've learned since 9-11, that the, plane, the chances that the planes brought the buildings down and the fires, virtually zero. What I want to suggest to you is that the chances that the hijacker pilots flew the planes into the buildings is also approximately zero. In my book, Black 9-11, I present two separate lines of evidence that Remote access and control technology existed at the time of 9-11. That this was already, this technology had already come of age. And I think we have to consider the possibility that it was used on the attack. I believe it was used to fly three of the planes into the buildings. But tonight I'm going to talk about the other plane, the fourth plane, United Flight 93. That's the one that went astray. And to me, this is the most interesting of the four flights for a number of reasons. <clears throat> 
because I believe that something went wrong with the plan. And for some reason, the perpetrators were not able to take to remotely access and control Flight 93. And we, you know, the result was that this thing was wandering around the countryside. We got a, a look at what the hijackers could do, you know, on their own. And, uh, <laughs> but before we go there, I'm going to present a scenario, uh, propose a new shoot down scenario. But before we go there, let's look at what did not happen. Okay, because there's a lot of reports, stories on the internet that Flight 93 was taken down by one of the NORAD fighters. And I want to propose to you that th that did not happen. I was very fortunate to have access to the 9-11 radar data, thanks to John Farmer. Now, this is a different John Farmer than the individual who was on the 9-11 Commission. This John Farmer is a uh, process control engineer and uh, had a career in law enforcement. And he's a very fine investigator. And he pursued the Freedom of Information Act for the 9-11 radar data. And an honest bureaucrat released that data in October 2007. And John has made that data available to us. So I'm going to have to walk over here to, the, uh, to explain this first image, which is a compilation of the radar data for the fighters from Langley Air Force Base. I hope you can hear me, because I want to shine a pointer on it. Okay, Washington is there. This is Langley Air Force Base. The fighters made three wild goose chases before they got to Washington. Yeah. Okay, three wild goose chases. First they flew out to sea, right? <laughs> then they threw toward, flew toward Baltimore. The third wild goose chase, they missed Washington by 40 miles on the third try. Look, they went 40 miles south of Washington. Okay? Three mistakes in a row. They didn't get to Washington until about 10 o'clock. Okay, they didn't get to Washington until 10 o'clock. Okay, well, I'll, I have to stay here. We're filming. <laughs> the point is that the Langley fighters never made it to Shanksville. Okay, so the stories you may have seen on the internet, they're mistaken or misinformation. Could we have the next slide, please? Okay, this is a compilation of the radar data for the fighters from Andrews Air Force Base, also F-16s. Now they flew south on a training mission to North Carolina earlier that morning, and they were recalled to Andrews when the attacks started, but they didn't get back to Andrews until around 10:15, after Flight 93 had already crashed. So they did not shoot down Flight 93. None of them flew north of Washington. Could I have the third one, please? This is a compilation of all of the radar data showing all of the NORAD aircraft on 9-11 between 9.45 and 10.15 a.m. Now, as you can see, I, the, this comes out real well. You can, you can see that 
I think you can identify Shanksville there in southern Pennsylvania. Shanksville's right there. None of the fighters got anywhere near Shanksville during this critical time frame. The only NORAD plane <clears throat> that was in the vicinity of Flight 93 was a C-130 National Guard plane that was flying from Andrews back to Minnesota. And you can see the zigzag there in, the, in its flight path because the air traffic controllers routed this plane out of the flight path of Flight 93. So it took a zig to the northeast and then another zag back toward Minnesota. This plane never got closer than 17 miles to, to Flight 93. Okay. Let's, can we have the fourth one now, please? This is a workup by Miles Kara, who was a 9-11 Commission staffer, and he prepared the radar analysis for the 9-11 Commission. He earlier had been on the, a member of the Joint Inquiry, part of that staff, in 2002. This was released in 2009. It shows the flight path of Flight 93, and it shows the C-130. You can recognize the zig and the zag there, I think. And uh, although I would say that C-130 flight is suspicious, I've seen no evidence that it played any role in the downing of Flight 93. <clears throat> Down in the lower left corner <clears throat> is the flight path of a Falcon 20 commuter jet that was on an approach to Johnstown Airport that morning, and it was rerouted by air traffic controllers to the crash site. And that, that Falcon 20 circled the crash site, but it did not arrive until eight minutes after the crash. Now that's an eternity, you know, in the time frame of 9-11. There were at least 18 witnesses in Shanksville, probably more. Some of their stories were on the, posted on the internet. Many people reported seeing a, a fighter or a jet or a, some kind of aircraft in the sky. But the FBI did not interview any of the witnesses, did not cross-check any of the testimony, find out what really happened, and neither did the 9-11 Commission. Now this is basic detective work that is used, it's just standard protocol in solving crimes, but it wasn't done on 9-11, after 9-11, uh, you know, in the wake of the greatest crime and terrorist event in U.S. history. One of the witnesses, Susan McElwain, reported seeing an object, an aircraft, before the crash. Okay, so obviously she did not see this commuter jet. Another fact, the commuter jet never flew below 6,000 feet. We know this because it was always on radar, and radar in the vicinity of Shanksville was blind below 6,000 feet because of the Allegheny Mountains, and because of the distance from the NORAD long-range radar towers. Radar coverage is limited in Shanksville, around Shanksville. So the fact that the Falcon 20 was always on radar tells us it never flew below 6,000 feet, therefore it could not be what Susan McElwain saw. Had to be something else. And there are, there are a couple of good interviews on YouTube uh, where Susan McElwain explains what she saw, and it appears that she may have seen an unmanned aerial vehicle. It was possibly a missile. However, 
she said that when she, as soon as she saw this thing come down over her car and it swooped down about 40 feet off the ground, for some reason she turned off her car radio and it was very silent. This, this was a silent running aircraft. And I think that tells us it could not have been a jet, did not have a jet engine in it. That would tend to rule out a missile. We, we have not yet identified what she saw. One of the reasons I went to Shanksville in 2011 was to try to confirm the reports on the internet of unexplained power outages in the vicinity of Shanksville. The power company had no explanation. It did not take me long to confirm those reports. Within a matter of hours, I spoke with two residents who told me, and I want to tell you, the people in Shanksville were great. They were all very open and willing to talk, you know, about 9-11. It was a wonderful experience being there. And both cases reported that just before the event, just before the crash, t the TV went out, you know, phone line went dead. And so we have an anomalous power outage. I think it's very significant. Another, another anomalous detail I also learned from the radar data. Moments before 9-11, uh, Flight 93 crashed, the transponder came back on. It had gone off earlier after the hijacking. And by the way, I believe that the hijackers did hijack the planes but I simply think that they were in turn hijacked. So the jackers were jacked, in my opinion. But the transponder came back on and that is unexplained. It makes no sense from the standpoint of hijackers. And I believe this could be evidence for a, uh, some kind of electrical malfunction and um, when you take all of this together, well, let me, let me mention another anomalous fact, another piece of evidence that has never been explained. We had debris fields far removed from the crash site. The debris field at New Baltimore, that's eight miles away. You cannot easily explain how debris could have been thrown back up in the air after a crash and deposited eight miles from the crash scene. Makes no sense. There was also debris at Indian Lake, which was at least two miles from the crash scene. Again, that's hard to explain. Unless there was an explosion on the somehow before the plane went down that breached the fuselage, that would explain it. And I suspect this is what happened. Now what caused that explosion? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't think we know yet, but there's another piece of supporting evidence for an explosion. One of the cell phone calls from Flight 93 was a gentleman named Ed Felt who reported that he was in the uh, washroom, the back of the plane. He was terrified. He said there had been an explosion and there was white smoke and the plane was going down and then the connection went dead. I know that cell phone calls are very suspect and I would not argue that other cell phone calls occurred, but this one I believe might have occurred because I believe the plane by that point was very low, a couple thousand feet, and it was very brief. The emotional affect was, appears to be authentic, and last spring we had a document released, another 9-11 Commission document, about this call, 
And apparently, um, according to this document, Felt had dialed a 911 number for the county directly west of the crash site, just west in, in Pennsylvania, just just to the west of the crash scene. And this, to me, this sounds bona fide. Another reason why I believe this phone call might have happened is because it does not support the official story. The official story says nothing about, a, about an explosion. They just passed over that. They never even looked at it. I think we all know the official story. After all, they made two movies about this flight. And it has become, um, you know, every, everybody knows that the hijackers just nosed down the plane as the cockpit was being stormed by the hijackers. Except there is no physical evidence supporting that outcome. That is strictly a legend. I know of no physical evidence supporting it, and I strongly question it. So when you add it all together, you add it all up, what do you get? Well, I suspect that <clears throat> What Susan McElwain saw that morning was a, an attack platform. And I believe what, were, what happened was the perpetrators re resorted to a contingency plan, a plan B, to make certain that this plane came down. Because the people, and especially the hijackers on the plane, could not be allowed to live. They had to die. And in fact, I believe that the perpetrators took great risks, in, and they exposed themselves. And that's why I'm, you know, I've become cautiously optimistic. There are some threads of evidence that we can, there's more research to be done here we might be able to actually expose that plan B. But I believe that all the evidence is consistent with the use of a directed energy weapon, for example, a high-powered microwave, which is very different than a laser. It would have a spread. You know, you would expect to have collateral effects, and that would explain, could explain how you could have a local power outage. It could explain why the transponder came back on. It might even explain an explosion because we know that this kind of electromagnetic interference can cause sparking, fires, and explosions. In fact, these planes, commercial aircraft, are very susceptible. They're very vulnerable to this kind of weapon. They have no defenses. They're not hardened against it. Military aircraft are often hardened, but you wouldn't expect, would not expect that with a civilian plane. There are still unanswered questions because there's, there's also evidence that the hijackers may have smuggled a bomb onto Flight 93. Now, I had originally discounted this possibility However, recently I have looked at it again, and um, several of the phone calls from the plane mention a bomb. There was also a transmission that air traffic controllers picked up that heard, they, they think it was from the cockpit of Flight 93, also about a bomb. And I have been reading the new book by Ali Safan, who was the chief FBI investigator in the coal bombing. And Safan mentions that, I believe it was Ramzi Youssef, actually 
attempted and succeeded in smuggling a bomb onto a plane. This was before 9-11. This was a, a dry run just to see if he could do it. And apparently he was successful and that thing went off and somebody was killed but it didn't bring the plane down. Well, if that happened, then I think that hijackers would have, certainly would have known about that and there's a possibility that this, had, this, this did happen. Did that, plane, did that bomb bring the plane down? I doubt it. A bomb would not explain the, um, and a missile also, by the way, would not explain the, un the anomalous power outages in Shanks and around Shanksville, would not explain why the transponder came back on. And there was another incident at Camp David that could be related to the crash of uh, United 93. In fact, on the morning of 9-11, there was confusion about where Flight 93 went down. So, some of the early reporting had it going down near Camp David. And there were witnesses near Camp David that reported seeing a, an aerial explosion near Camp David. And this appears to have been hushed up. And I present the evidence for this, this unexplained incident in my book. I think it could be related to what happened in Shanksville. If there was a drone in the area, that drone was never going to go back to base, right? It would have been terminated at some point. It would have been flown away, as far away from where it had originally taken off and away from Shanksville, and at some point it would have simply been terminated with onboard explosives. But whatever happened at Camp David, it could not have been a commercial-sized plane that went down because there's no way they could have hushed up that many fatalities. It had to be something else, something much smaller. So I, as I said, I'm cautiously optimistic because there are several potential areas for continuing research. There was another unexplained um, aircraft uh, that was on this diagram that was supposedly a Piper Cub and there was a flight plan for a Piper and but you know we need to check it out and we need to actually confirm that that Piper took off at a certain airport and landed at a certain airport and there there's a possibility if there was an incident at Camp David there that there may have been first responders up there and those people probably still exist, you know, they can be found. And so, you know, there's still more work to be done, but I'm cautiously optimistic. So I really don't have any more to present here. So thank you for listening. I might just add that there, my book is in the back if anybody wants a copy.